In this lesson, we're going to talk about how to determine the charge of an element when it becomes an ion. So the first thing you need to be familiar with is the monoatomic ions based on a periodic table. So if you go to Google Images and if you download a periodic table, you'll see these elements on the left. You have hydrogen. After that is lithium sodium, potassium, rubidium. As a pure element, these elements have a neutral charge. But when they become an ion, they will acquire a positive charge. So this is the alkali metals. Now hydrogen is not considered a metal, but lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, those are metals. So group run, group 1A represents the alkali metals. So for instance, sodium has 11 electrons, but only one electron in its outermost shell. So it only has one valence electron. When sodium reacts and gives up that valence electron, it becomes an ion. So the number of valence electrons that an atom has can give you a good idea of what kind of charge it's going to have when it becomes an ion. So elements that typically have one valence electron will usually form ions with a plus one charge. Now in group two, we have the alkaline earth metals. So like elements like beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium. These elements are in group two and they have two valence electrons. So because they have two valence electrons to give up, as an ion, they will typically form a two plus charge. So calcium, which has two valence electrons, when it reacts, it will typically give up those two electrons, forming the calcium two plus ion. So metals, they typically form positively charged ions, whereas nonmetals, they typically form negatively charged ions. Now in the middle, we have the transition metals, which we could talk about that later in this video. But to the right, we have elements like boron, aluminum, gallium, indium, thallium. So that's that's the group 3A elements, also known as group 13. Group 14 or group 4A, we have carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. Now, this group, they have three valence electrons. So you might be thinking that they will form a three plus charge, which in fact they do. But some of these elements also form a plus one charge. Now, I don't know for you, the viewer, if you've learned electron configuration, but if you have these elements here, they have S electrons. These elements here, they have P electrons. So for indium, actually, let's use aluminum. Aluminum, when you write the electron configuration, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. Notice that it has three valence electrons. When aluminum gives up those three valence electrons, it will have a three plus charge. Now the elements below that, like gallium and indium and thallium, instead of giving up all three electrons, sometimes they could just give up one electron. And so they can have a plus one charge. So understanding electron configuration will help you to get a better understanding of what type of charges certain ions or certain elements form when they become ions. So gallium, indium, thallium, they will typically form a plus one or a plus three charge, depending on the reaction conditions.
Now, here we have group 4A elements, which has four valence electrons, and they can form a 4 plus charge. But like these elements, some of them can have a 2 plus as well. So if you look at the electron configuration of silicon, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. Now, if silicon gives up all four of its valence electrons, it's going to have the 4 plus charge. If it gives up only two, it's going to have the 2 plus charge. So silicon, germanium, tin, and lead, when you research them, you'll find that they can have the, t the plus 2 oxidation state or the plus 4 oxidation state. Now, group 5A, elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, these are nonmetals. Arsenic may be considered a metalloid. It's kind of close to that region. But nitrogen and phosphorus are nonmetals. Remember, we said that metals like to give up electrons to form positively charged ions known as cations. Nonmetals, which is typically in this side of the periodic table, they like to acquire electrons and form negatively charged ions called anions. Now, nitrogen has five valence electrons. And it wants to acquire electrons to have a field octet. So it wants to gain three electrons to satisfy its octet requirement. Once it gains those three electrons, it's going to have a three minus charge. So group 5A elements, they will typically form a 3 minus charge. Now, group 6A elements, they have six valence electrons. This is like oxygen, sulfur, selenium. And they only need two more to get to 8. Once they acquire those two electrons, they will have a charge of 2 minus. And then you have the group 7A elements like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. These are the halogens. Group 6A, they're the calcogens. Now, the halogens, they have seven valence electrons. They only need one more to get to eight. So they will generate a negative one charge once they get that one electron to have eight electrons in their outermost energy level. So that's how you could determine the charge of an element when it becomes an ion using the periodic table. It has to do with the number of valence electrons. When metals give up their valence electrons, they will acquire a positive charge. And that positive charge is determined by how many valence electrons that metal gives up. The nonmetals, when they acquire electrons, the number of electrons that they acquire will determine the charge that they're going to have. So here's a formula that will help you to calculate ion charge. The ion charge is the difference between the number of protons that an atom has and the number of electrons. So let's use aluminum as an example. Aluminum, if you look up in a periodic table, it has a mass number of 27 and an atomic number of 13. Now, an atom has an equal number of protons and electrons. So atoms are electrically neutral. Ions, the reason why they have a charge is because the number of protons and electrons are different. And another thing you need to know is that the atomic number of an element is equal to the number of protons. So aluminum will always have 13 protons. If that number is different, it's no longer aluminum. As an atom, aluminum will have 13 electrons, and so its ion charge will be zero. Now, in order to form this three plus charge, aluminum has to give up three electrons. When it does that, 
it will have 10 electrons. And so 13 protons minus 10 electrons, you get a charge of plus 3 or 3 plus. In the case of oxygen, oxygen has a mass number of 16 and an atomic number of 8. So as an atom, oxygen has 8 protons, 8 electrons, so its ion charge is 0. Now, when oxygen gains 2 more electrons to satisfy its octet requirement, it will have 10 electrons. And so at that point, its charge will be negative 2. So that's the formula for calculating ion charge. It's simply the difference between the number of protons and electrons that the ion has. Now, sometimes you might be given the formula of an ionic compound. Let's say like this, copper to chloride. When you see this Roman numeral, it tells you the oxidation state of the metal. So it tells you that you're dealing with the copper 2 plus ion. Because when you're dealing with transition metals, many of the transition metals have multiple oxidation states. So as an ion, they can have different charges. So even like some of the non-transition the non-transition metals like lead. Lead has two oxidation states. We talked about it already, 2 plus and 4 plus. So if you see a compound that says lead 2 oxide, the Roman numeral 2 tells you you're dealing with Pb2 plus. If you see a compound that says lead 4 sulfide, well in this case lead has a 4 plus charge. So make sure you understand that difference. But with that being said, let's go over some of the common charges of the common transition metals that you'll deal with in a typical chemistry course. So the most two common oxidation states for copper are these two, the copper plus charge and the copper two plus ion. Now the copper two plus ion is more common than the copper plus one ion. So if you don't have a compound with a Roman numeral, and if you have to guess, chances are it's more likely going to be copper 2 plus than copper plus 1, but both of these can occur. Now for iron metal, there's two common oxidation states, 2 and 3. So those are the two most common ions you'll see with iron metal. Fe2 plus is more stable than Fe3 plus, so iron is usually most likely to be in this form. Now, cobalt has two common oxidation states. It has others too, but these are the most common, the 2 plus and the 3 plus ion. The 2 plus ion is more stable, so that's going to be more common. Zinc, nickel, cadmium, most of the time, they will have the 2 plus oxidation state. Now, this is not always the case, but in a typical general chemistry course, more than 90% of the time, those will be the charges of those ions. For chromium, it's usually in one of these two forms, 2 plus or 3 plus. 99% of the time, silver is in the plus 1 oxidation state. I've also seen a plus 3 oxidation state for other compounds, but more than 90% of the time, it will be Ag plus 1. Gold, I've seen plus 1 and plus 3 for this. So if you want to commit that to memory, those are some charges that those elements will form as an ion. Now, for the polyatomic ions, for the most part, you need to commit this to memory. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post some videos in the description section below this video, one of which will be the polyatomic ions that you need to know. So feel free to watch those videos if you want to memorize the charges of these ions. So sulfide, which we talked about earlier, this is what is known as a monoatomic ion. Mono means one. Poly means many. 
sulfite, SO3 2 minus, that's a polyatomic ion. Because this ion is composed of many atoms. One sulfur atom and three oxygen atoms. Sulfate, that's also a polyatomic ion. Notice that the sulfur ions, they typically have a 2 minus charge. The monatomic ion phosphide has a 3 minus charge. Phosphite and phosphate also have a 3 minus charge. Now this works for the halogens as well. So chloride, bromide, iodide, they follow this trend. Chloride has a negative 1 charge, and the same is true for hypochlorite, chlorite, chlorate, and perchlorate. They all have the same charge. So at least that'll help you if you're trying to memorize this. Now, not all elements follow this trend. Nitride has a 3 minus charge, but nitrite and nitrate has a negative 1 charge. So for those elements, it's different. And for other polyatomic elements, you just have to commit them to memory. So like cyanide, ammonium, carbonate, acetate, most of these you have to commit to memory. Now there's something else that can help you to determine the charge of an ion, particularly if hydrogen is evolved. So for instance, oxide has a negative 2 charge. And let's say we want to determine the charge on hydroxide. Whenever you add a hydrogen to a negatively charged ion, and you combine them together to form a new ion, these ions, they're attracted to each other because they have opposite charges. Opposites attract, like charges repel. When you combine these two ions, the ion of this charge will be the sum of these two exponents. So if you were to add negative 2 and positive 1, you're going to get negative 1. So hydroxide has a minus 1 charge. Consider this example, phosphate, which has a negative 3 charge. If you add a hydrogen ion to it, and you get monohydrogen phosphate, negative 3 plus 1 will give you negative 2. So this has a negative 2 charge. If you add another hydrogen to it, the charge is going to decrease, it's going to increase by 1. So negative 2 plus 1, this is going to be H2PO4 now, and so it's going to be minus 1, and so forth. So for instance, let's say if you have this substance, bisulfate or hydrogen sulfate. Actually, that's bisulfite or hydrogen sulfite. What is the charge on hydrogen sulfite? You know that sulfite has a negative 2 charge, Hydrogen has a plus 1 charge, so if you combine them together, negative 2 plus 1, that'll give you a negative 1 charge. Now earlier we said that ammonium has a plus 1 charge. So if you were to combine nitride with 4 hydrogen ions, this will give you ammonium. So if we were to do the math, we have negative 3 and we have 4 plus 1 ions. So that's negative 3 plus 4. That'll give us positive 1. So ammonium has a plus 1 charge. So that's another way or another technique that you can employ to determine the charge of an ion or even polyatomic ions. But for the most part, you're going to have to memorize uh, the polyatomic ion list. So that's it for this video. Don't forget to check the links in the description section below for other related chemistry topics. And thanks for watching.